for those of you who haven't checked out the agenda, this is the last thing on, on for Drupal at the Rock. It's just going to be a responsive design panel. We'll talk about the challenges and benefits of responsive design, pros and cons. Um, and in the spirit of responsive design, I'd like to keep this a very fluid conversation. So if you have a question while the panelists are, are speaking, just raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you and you can, and you can get started. So um, I want to get started with introductions. I think most of you already know everybody, but I'd like you just to state who you are and what your focus is specifically. And uh, yeah, why don't we start with you? You're the only one who no one's met yet. Yeah, and I know the least about the subject. Uh, I'm Nick Johnson, uh, and I run digital sport, uh, sales for sports for the portfolio. Uh, Ray Woods, Director of User Experience for uh, NBC Universal. Josh Clark, I'm an interaction designer for a little agency called Global Moxie. Uh, Sam Richard, Senior Front End Developer for the Publisher Team. Chris Herring, the least smart guy on the podium right now. <laughs> <But> smartest dressed. <laughs> and again, I'm Teresa Finch. I lead, uh, I'm the Director of Creative Development and Design for ONTS. Um, so the first question I'd actually like everybody to answer and if we can, pull up the sites as they are mentioned, because I'd like for people to get examples of these sites up when we, um, as they're mentioned. So the first question is, responsive design. Who does it best in the media industry, in any industry? And is there a company that has implemented responsive design poorly, in your opinion, and why? I guess there's three questions there. So the first question, of course, is who does it best in the media industry? Do you want to start with Chris? Oh, oh <laughs> with me. I'm sorry. I didn't know we were going that from me. Um, I like a little site called DBTV. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's, uh, it's, it's 100% responsive. It's built on Publisher 7, which is built on Drupal. So we're very proud of it. And uh, uh, it has some of the cleanest responsive design code I've ever seen. So. All right. <laughs> Sam, you, media industry. Um, I am uh, the two big media groups, um, media being used a little bit loosely here, that I really like and I generally point to are bostonglobe.com, which is a newspaper, and uh, Disney, the Disney homepage. Uh, Josh? I think one of my responsive sites is a website called polygon.com. It's a video game site, really classy design and very clever, responsive uh, behavior on all of its page types. And, and I think that you often do see a, naturally sort of the tech community, which which I would sort of put this apart, is often sort of the most uh, maybe enthusiastic in, in the ways that they tackle this and are starting to move us beyond simply how the thing works to sort of adding some of the, the polish to it. But I think also news sites sort of naturally have, have been sort of leaders in, in kind of figuring out how the blocks of this thing work. In addition to the one you mentioned, I'd also mention uh, HoustonChronicle.com. What about you, Ray? Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of an old fashioned fan of uh, Boston as well. Um, I think that you know it's uh, simple and kind of really communicates the information uh, how you would want it. Nick, uh, as a new student of this game, um, I'm going to go to the Boston Globe largely. That's because that's where everybody pointed me to. But um, <laughs> you know, as a sales guy, I think watching traditional brands experiment and get smart about. Um, being on the tip of the spear is interesting for us to watch and emulate, so I'll go with the Boston Globe. Can I add one more? Yes. I, th I think Nick might like is uh, sbnation.com. That's a good one. Yep, that is a good one, too. So are oh there any gosh, others please. that are not necessarily media that you particularly like? Anybody? Starbucks. Starbucks? Um, I really like uh, Notre Dame's website. Let's pull that one up. And I like um, United Pixel Workers, which is an e-commerce site. They are... An e they are a shopping site, t-shirt shop, but built by web design designers. So it's super responsive and super awesome. So weird. I was going to go with United Pixel Workers as well. <laughs> so, so weird. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I think I think uh, you bring up a great point, Sam, which is that often we look at sort of content and media sites, and there's often uh, a, a view. It's like, oh, well, sure, you can do it with content sites, but what about web apps? And what about um, uh, um, e-commerce apps. And another one that I would sort of mention in the e-commerce area is tattly.com, which is a um, temporary tattoos sales site. So it's like the, the idea, just sort of as an aside, is the, these temporary tattoos are just awful. The things that you put on your kid's skin are terrible, but these are these sort of really designed uh, and kind of clever uh, temporary tattoos. But also in terms of web apps, we're starting to see some things. Um, some studio mates of mine are, are doing this thing called Editorially, uh, editorial.ly, which I'm not sure if it's launched yet, but it's a full-on sort of uh, content management system, collaborative writing system that is fully responsive. 
I asked uh, David to pull this one up because this is the one that I like. It's all up a wrestle. It's not media industry at all, but it's I really like the way the menu changes in orientation based on the screen size. Anybody else have any more favorites that they want to bring up and share with the audience? All right, let's move on to the next question. So this one's really dear to my heart as a designer. Um, how do we convince an audience, and what I mean by audience are the people who are actually going in and viewing the site, not necessarily the people who are creating the site, uh, who are used to rich design, that responsive is a better user experience. And by rich design, I mean back in the old days when you went to Disney, you kind of expected there to be a lot of flash, and a lot of animation, and not necessarily have to be flash. It could just be JavaScript or that sort of thing, or animated GIF. But now you go, as we've already pointed out, it's sort of a flat experience. So as a consumer, I might go there and think, wow, they're really sort of cheating us and not giving us anything very, what was happening to the company now? They're not putting money into their web design. Now, we all know that that's not the, the reason they're doing this, but how do we convince people, how do we convince the audience this is the way to go? There is, um, there is a great talk from South by Southwest last year by a guy named Christopher um, L. Ludlow, I think? Mm, Ludlow? I think right. Something like that. Um, and it's uh, a hierarchy mm. of mobile user needs. And essentially what, this, uh, what his talk uh, was about was taking the hierarchy of human needs and converting it to uh, needs for a website. And, the, and what he uh, suggests is that primarily, primary above all else, users want their content and their navigation. Then they want, uh, they want to be able to read their site. Then they want to be able to share. Then the very last thing that they want is super pretty design and sort of flashiness. So I don't think that many users outside from us designers who really are looking toward to that uh, care that it's not as flashy. What they care about, like the, the running theme of this entire day is that they care about our content. And if our content is there and is usable and accessible across device, and we don't punish them for coming to our site on a phone. I think that's what they'll care about, and not necessarily that we don't have the fancy flash animations. What about you? Right? I can that, still that, do that. That's an interesting point, but but I think it's less about flashy animations and more about the brand message, right? So Disney gives you these rich experiences when you go to the park. They don't let you see any of the wires. They don't let you see any of the characters out of character, right? So. Um, I think it's less about making it look pretty and more about staying true to what the brand message is. So, so maybe uh, I'm not a fan of the, the uh, Disney redesigned uh, responsive website. Um, I think it's too heavy and, and it lacks some of that character that really, that magical experience that is the Disney brand. I don't think it brings that and uses the advantages. It's more like they checked off the box and were responsive. I, you know, I, I think I, I would say, in terms of how do we convince people of a rich design experience versus the value of responsive design, I don't think they even know that it's a responsive website. I mean, to your point, it's like nobody's resizing their browser window for kicks. Like, oh, I love it. I love it. It's responsive. I mean, the value to them is that, oh, whatever device they're using, the website has full content, which is a great value. Uh, but I think that, I guess, more to a core thing, I guess I would reject the idea that responsive design is necessarily flat. I think that, as I said earlier, it's sort of one of the things that we're we're doing is just trying to figure out how to make the thing work. How do we make this thing flex in the first place? And so some of the the polish that we necessarily would would put into techniques that we're more familiar with, we haven't developed yet, and we're still working on those patterns and how to do it. So who was working on it on the web during the transition from tables to CSS? And you remember the first CSS sites? There were just boxes everywhere, right? And then there was the CSS Zen Garden that said, "Look what you can do." with this, you know, that you started to see, oh, this can be beautiful and this can be rich. And the truth is, is that ultimately these are just HTML5 websites. You can do anything in a responsive design that you could do in other sites. There are challenges. It's harder to make it, to make, to figure it out, to figure out the puzzle pieces. But you can do anything. So it's, I think it's, it's this natural thing of like, this is a new technology and we're figuring out how to make it work and we will figure out how to make it more beautiful and, and richer too. But I think you're right that when you look out at responsive designs right now, there's a lot of sameness. And part of that is also just the, the nature of design trend. Design is fashionable and follows trends, and right now we have a very flat um, sort of design aesthetic that I think doesn't necessarily put responsive design at its best uh, Did you have a thought, Chris? aspect. Did well, I was going to uh, ask Nick what yeah, advertisers expect. Well, I, before you get the advertisers, I think you have to start with the consumer, and the consumer doesn't care about any of this. I mean, that, that's, that's the reality. And so, 
you know, when ESPN rolls out a redesign, forget the business reasons why they do it or, or the design reasons, the consumer comes in and has to take a punch. And basically, nobody likes change. So that that's, I think, the first resistance that, that the consumer encounters. And so I'm just a big believer in, you know, whatever the business rationale is for making a change, we, we have to believe in, in the sort of the strategy behind the business rationale and then make sure that we serve up the best experience as possible. At the end of the day, it's about super serving the consumer first. Uh, and you know the, the presumption here is that obviously any design changes we make are done with that in mind and the business follows closely behind it. Um, and, and I think that's where it, it does, it gets tricky for us. I, I do think that um, from a consumer perspective and an advertiser perspective, we're in a, an interesting place. I mean, technology is right in front of our noses, but widespread adoption is further out. And I think it is really smart that we're talking about this today because the world is going to change really quickly. And at some point, we're going to pull the trigger on a decision on the sports sites or all the sites or subsections of the business. And, and the consumer will react violently to it at first. And we have to believe that because of who we are and because of the strength of the brands and the strength of the product that we put every day, they'll keep coming back and then they'll, they'll sort of deal with the change and then see all the benefit as they migrate from um, the website to their tablet to their smartphone and see that there's a lot of continuity to experience. Uh, the content is served up in a way that's actually better for them and more forward leaning than, than was prior. Um, but everywhere I've worked on the digital side, it doesn't matter why you make the change. It almost doesn't matter what improvements you make. The consumer always reacts because it's new and they don't get it. And, and this is a very, very subtle nuance change, I think, that will require some getting used to. Okay. I think that leads into another design question. But um... Sorry, let's go ahead and on. I don't actually have a question. I have some insight into what um, we were just speaking about. So, you know, we read a device in Blaster.com. It's fully, re it's fully responsive design. Um, and we did have a lot of backlash. So every comment on the site um, pretty much was negative, And we kind of had to ignore that um, because, you know, people don't like change. But in reality, our numbers have shown increases in growth and that could be just because of the better usability or whatnot but overall we did we did see growth within a matter of days yeah. we we knew we were already growing so i think just to reinforce it's, that I, I think it, it's a vocal minority right i mean when we when we live streamed everything in the olympics and then in uh in london i got into i am i lucky that i was sober at the time because i got into this <laughs> twitter battle with 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 dennis crowley from foursquare and he was pissed that we were not airing Phelps and Lockie live in the middle of the afternoon. It's like, well, wait a second, we're delivering you everything live via the web. And, you know, it took a little bit of education and he realized shortly thereafter, we talked about it not in the public domain, that the change is actually good. You just have to understand what, what's behind it. And so the reality is they came in, they took their punch, the vocal minority bitched about it. And the people that love device and blaster came back and said, oh, this is pretty cool. And through more pages. So I have, I have one question on that. Um, what did you do when you launched the site? Um, we went like this. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I, I, think that, I think that goes a long way um, to solving this is consumer education, right? So we, we run focus groups for all our shows. Um, we run pilots. Um, when we make a big change like this, we, we, we have a television network or many television networks yeah. to start communicating these changes and to show people uh, what the advantages are and to build anticipation of the change so that they're actually asking for the change rather than being f it being forced upon them. Something to think yeah, about. Yeah, no, no. Well, I mean, just a total pair. I love hijacking the agenda to talk about something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You know, we're, we, we live in a... I mean, it's, it's, it's very true that we should be able to do that. It's very hard to do. When you look at just... The fact that we are authenticating all of our cable networks to get your username and password through your cable provider to stream live, we've got every reason and every asset in the world to blast through how do you authenticate on a, in a Comcast home. We don't do a great job at it. So it's it's, it's 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 true. It's both. It's just it's really hard to educate these consumers. All right, I'll we'll go to the next question. With the emergence of the Retina Display iPad in multiple resolution devices. 
have pixels had their day? I know Sam's going to love this one. Uh, and has the concept of pixel perfect designs gone in favor of percentage and in based designs? Are we going to abandon Photoshop? I didn't install Photoshop. <laughs> Chris? Um, I had to. I'm sorry. My mic is dead, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, I don't think so. And I, and I know how Ray feels about this, so feel free to follow up. I think it's going to become more of a nuanced world. I think, you know, just like. Uh, it makes sense for designers to know something about coding in order to see their designs, you know, more quickly uh, on an actual screen rather than just in Photoshop or on an actual device. I think it also makes. I think the opposite is true, right? I think it makes sense for a designer, uh, a developer, to know like what tools are actually available in Photoshop and what things should I talk to designers about to maybe stay away from in Photoshop. So I don't think it, I don't think it's binary. Yeah, I agree. I think it really depends on the fidelity of the comp that you need, right? Sometimes uh, a sketch on the back of a napkin is enough to, you know, launch ships across the ocean. So um, sometimes you need a Photoshop comp to be able to show to an executive um, what the general direction of the site will look like in this kind of size, right? Um, and I think that that's an important communication tool to make sure branding and color and stuff are right. Um, but we are definitely moving into a world where that is not the first way to do it. It's just a support of um, actually coding in the tools. Yeah, photo comps are lies right now, right? And there's no such thing as a, as a here's, a, here's what your website will look like. Uh, so that I think that's exactly right, is that you need to use these things as sort of a, a brochure for the website and, and sort of make it clear that it's like, this is part of what we're gonna show. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real transition and process, I think, that we're seeing right now. I know in my own, Practice, uh, uh, including you know, sort of um, designing into big media companies, uh, and and the political strata that that involves, where you need to sort of show something to reassure the person at the top who's not involved in the process that things are going okay. When to introduce that stuff? I mean, most of the stuff that that I would say is sort of trying to do now is much more uh, doing things all at once, so that in parallel you're doing. Um, uh, uh, wireframes in the browser while you're doing sort of some design work and the things kind of come together at this incredibly scary moment. Uh, and that's really sort of more realistic so that you can actually see wireframes in the browser flexing. This is how the website works. But it's hard work. And it's like, when do you introduce the visual into that? And frankly, you know, the waterfall process has a lot of utility into sort of saying, we've got to this part. Sign off. Everybody signed off. Good. On to the next. And now it's much messier. You know, it's a much more fluid process like the website itself where you, there aren't as clear sort of sign-off points, and it becomes more gradual and iterative and agile. I mean, sort of the agile process maps pretty well to the creative process in this. It's, it's hard, and it requires um, leaps of faith uh, on all people and a little bit of imagination. <coughs> Showing people a comp is, is dangerous. It creates certain expectations that have to be sort of talked around and addressed because we still think of these things as this is a picture of what the website will look like, and that, like I said earlier, is, is a lie right now. Yeah, I think uh, to add on that, uh, it's not so much that uh, <coughs> high-resolution displays have killed Pixel Perfect. It's the fact that there is no one display that we can design for anymore that killed Pixel Perfect. The fact that we are building websites for all displays, for all contexts, um, for all different sizes, that's really where percentages and M-based design have, have come from. And, why a static photo, and um, besides the fact that Photoshop comps never have, act, have always been sort of lies, they are now true, true giant lies because it's, it's not what your site will look like. A Photoshop comp, even the highest fidelity using, uh, using the best techniques of exactly what you can do on the web, that is no longer what your site looks like. It is a slice of your site at a specific viewport for a specific user at a specific point in time. Um, any, all web developers in here, the very first question that we ask when we get a Photoshop comp is what's the hover color for links? Because <laughs> it's, it's, you can't show that. So one of the things that uh, designing in browser and doing some wireframing in browser and having designers know CSS, not, I'm not advocating for designers to become front end developers, but if they know the tools and techniques that go into building the web, they're able to design better and have a common language with the actual implementation and therefore allow for <coughs> better designs that work better across all devices <coughs> to get to the web faster and to be able to interact with them faster and to be able to see where a design might fall down faster 
to pivot on that and to, uh, to work on it faster. Okay. So next question. What is your advice for those considering a retrofit of their website and already have a lot invested in non-responsive, friendly content? I just want to embarrass Angie and say goodbye to her. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Bye, Angie. Bye. Did you guys get that question, or yes. shall I repeat it? Okay. <coughs> People who, who do, if they want to retrofit their site with their content, what is your advice? I mean, I think I know. You what mean it is. instead of rebuilding, like truly from scratch? Yes. Um, uh, have a drink. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, look, I, I think that look, all, with the exception of, of ads, as we've been talking about, pretty much all web content is inherently flexible, right? So there are some interventions that you can do if you're not ready to tackle a full web design. There are some interventions that you can do to make things flex at least a little bit better, or sort of in you know move columns down below. I, I think there's there's some ways that you can do it. Um, I think you have to sort of say, well, what's the motive? You know, is, is it just so that you have a responsive design? Because again, that's not the goal, right? The goal is a great user experience on whatever device. And so if you, you're like, wow, we need to make this look better on this device, well then that's a worthwhile kind of quick fix. It's hacky. I think it's important to understand that responsive web design is a hack. You know, I mean, it's something that front-end designers came up with because back-end systems weren't moving fast enough. You know, it's sort of like, wow, we need to make all these changes to the content management system, and we're not making any changes to the content management system. What can we do on the front end? And part of the problem is with responsive design is that we're overloading it with too many tasks. You know, we're sort of trying to say, okay, make, so at an arrow width, we're talking about mobile, right? Mm, probably, but not necessarily. And we're we're putting a lot of weight on screen sizes, which frankly is all responsive web design is uh, addresses. So, um, and to, to speak more to the how to physically actually retrofit it. Um, this kind of goes back to uh, designers needing to learn the language of, of the web. Um, grids are something that hopefully all designers are using, but if not, uh, they can. the first thing they can do is put their design onto a grid, even if it's an asymmetric grid, it doesn't need to be a, a symmetric grid like what we're traditionally used for. Use two 12 equal columns, it can be odd sized columns, and then with that, um, there's some pretty simple math to turn those, those fixed widths into fluid widths. And once you have the fluid percentages, then you can start applying those and start using the responsive web design techniques like media queries. Um, another great thing to do just off the bat is, you know, part of responsive web design is also front end performance. So one of the quick and easy wins for Retrofitting a site isn't necessarily retrofitting a full responsive site, but rather making your front end more performant. Uh, making sure that all of the images being served are the sizes they need to be and not any larger. Um, making sure that they're optimized, making sure you're using image sprites. Basic website front end optimization techniques will go a long way. Swapping out rounded corners for CSS3 border radii and uh, shadows for, or transparent pings with shadows for box shadows. Just some basic front-end performance techniques will go a long way. Mm -hmm. Great. So we've seen some ideas of how ads could evolve to be responsive today already. What do you think the future of responsive design advertising is? Uh, you know, it, it's really funny. I was at a, a seller's forum earlier today, and I don't have a, a neat answer to put into a box, but I do think everybody's struggling with, um, you know, an ad in a box is a useful thing, but with social, with geo, the example you showed for Subway, with the convergence of all this um, stuff happening and with advertisers figuring out that their conversation is not just on their website or in ads on our site, but pushing out their messaging. The big conversation today was about Oreos and the Super Bowl and the fact that you can leverage social tools to get out there. I think um, being really flexible as, as as a destination, um, being able to pull in ads that can leverage our content and pull in dynamic content from the advertiser to make a robu more robust experience that's contextually relevant um, is part of it. The other part of it is, as I look to um, Sochi and look to just how quickly devices are um, evolving. You know, when we sold Beijing, there wasn't a tablet, and by London, I think. A third of our traffic was on tablets, and, and we were not prepared necessarily to deal with that um, entirely. Is 
I, I think things are only going to get more complicated. I think it puts a big burden on ad ops. I think it puts a big burden on sales. I think it puts a big burden on the creative shops that have to figure out how to build these messages if we don't make um, the advertising experience a lot more fluid um, and eliminate a lot of friction, like specking out lots of sizes. And so I think that the end state of the, this sort of revolution of devices is only going to continue. Um, we've got to figure out a way to make that advertising, that creative execution easier to distribute everywhere, as well as our content. So I think, I think, it's, I think it's inevitable, and I think the big problem that we face um, is that the advertising model is, is really troubled right now. It's a very inefficient business. The margins are really thin. Um, and so I, I kind of harken back to five or six years ago when we launched the full episode player on NBC. Um, we had this great proposition for advertisers. Uh, you know, seven years ago, you had creative directors and, and uh, CMOs saying nobody ever cried over a banner ad. And they were right, banner ads weren't all that exciting. So now we had sight sound in motion and video online, but taking 30s from the network and just digitizing them and throwing them up in front of our content wasn't a super compelling advertising experience for digital. So we married video and animation and interactivity with this sort of captive uh, consumer, and nobody knew how to build ads for it. And so we really had to take it upon ourselves that for our best advertisers, we're spending the most money for our company. At the end of the day, a big part of how we make money is through advertising. We brought that capability in-house and we built those ads for them. And we spent probably four or five years throwing research at the, at the agencies to show that this marriage of video and interactivity was a really effective advertising vehicle for them. And we have this huge body of work that shows it and proves it out again and again and again. And so I think you know the short-term step is at some point, We'll be ready for this, whether we're first or, if we're, or we fast follow. And I think organizationally, we're going to need to be prepared to be a much better partner to our advertisers to help them figure out how to optimize the creative process um, to take advantage of this innovation, this evolution, because my guess is most advertisers won't be ready for it. I was just going to add that I think um, if the IAB could try to get out ahead of it yep. and um, adopt something like we demo today as an HTML5 standard, um, I sort of find it ironic that the um, responsive design solution that the IAB offers is on a site that is not responsive. <laughs> that sounds about right. And uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think that thinking is embedded in, in the organization just yet, yet so many people just point back to them and say, well, those are the standards, so that's what we're going to deliver creative in, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's a little nuanced, Nick, but um, I think if we can get them on board and get them sort of pushing agencies in a certain direction, um, I think it'll help. Well, the thing I would add, and, and, and it's a big reason why I came today, uh, because I really couldn't comment on the death of the pixel, so there are clearly gaps in my knowledge base here, um, is that you know, the reality is, is that there's a lot going on in this space. Uh, there are a lot of priorities. Some are sexy, some are completely unsexy, you know, third-party cookies, trading desks, um, real-time automated buying. Like there's big stuff that the IAB is trying to figure out. And the nice thing about the IAB is it, it creates a platform where you can, you can create innovation that sort of starts small, sort of as a, you know, a subsection of rich media, whatever you want to call it, lets you get together with your peers, lets you get together with your competitors and start thinking through um, best practices and things to avoid. And then it lets us get ourselves collectively ready to go and prioritize it and bring it to market. Um, and I, I think that's super critical because, because our business is only getting more complex and you know there's probably 100 priorities that are bouncing around this building right now. And the, 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 the thing that brings it to life is the advertiser. That's where the money is. And so you know, it's really important to partner to make sure we prioritize the right things and, and stagger the rollout. Um, in a, in a place that's going to be optimal for us all to succeed. Yeah, I, I agree. The only thing I would add is um, I don't envy the position the IAB is in because you're right. They're working on many, many different priorities right yep. now, that, and they're all the top priority. Right. I mean, I, I have some hope that I mean, I think the IAB is sort of smart to, have to do these kind of juried competitions to identify mm -hmm. rising stars, sort of candidates yeah. for what might become a thing, so that people can see some some great ideas and experiment with them. I think also one one question sort of goes to what you were you were saying with the wow, what is the right video advertising yeah. format? Is you know is is sort of display advertising as we know it, particularly for mobile, the right answer? I mean, how much branding can you do in this fifty pixel scrap of of uh, of real estate? 
you know, and, and so it's, I think some of this is, you know, our, our natural thing is to inherit what we had before and, and try it there, like you were saying with the 30s for, for pre-rolls and stuff like that. Um, but you know what? What is the mobile experience? And you look at sort of well, social is is kind of the the, the big sort of mobile uh, uh, sort of beachhead, as well as images, right? Yeah. Images are sort of what we consume and create on mobile. You know, how do we sort of start to think about this? I wish I had sort of better answers for what marketing and advertising is uh, for mobile, but I'm not sure that it's um, a 300 by 50 ad. Well, I can tell you that it's a really big problem that needs to be solved because. The, the ad network business has done a great job of completely commoditizing the mobile space in about one seventh of the time it took for them to commoditize the display space. Yeah. Um, and I think the problem is compounded by the fact that it is such an intimate device. I mean, you're holding it right here. It doesn't leave your side. And, uh, and I think the stakes are a lot higher in mobile in terms of what that creative execution is than it is on the desktop just because that the proximity of that relationship. And so we, you know, the, the conversation today from a pretty good, a pretty well-known banker was, you know, by design, advertising has always been disruptive. We broke up your TV show and jammed in ads uh, and made a lot of money off of it. But the, the, the real issue in mobile is, you know, if you're disruptive, you probably lose. And so we, we really, I don't think, have all that much that we can borrow from. I think we really have to innovate to be successful there. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be 10 cents on the dollar for a long time, and, which is a bad place to be. What's interesting, I've, I've seen, I don't know if you guys have seen this in, in your individual brands, for when the brands are selling the ads themselves, I've seen them able to get 50% or 60% more for mobile ads than for desktop ads. So the reverse of what you see in the ad network stats, the sort of like generically mobile is selling at, at, at pennies on the dollar uh, versus the desktop. And yet when brands are sending it out themselves and doing that sale are able to upsell yeah. mobile over desktop. Which is sort of well, there's, it's a bell curve. I mean, you know, the problem is, is that if, if you just, I'm going to have to spend more than two seconds on this, but if, if you just are buying display tonnage to buy display tonnage, you, you're going to buy lousy stuff. If you're coming to us to buy the Olympics or something like football, you're going to pay a massive premium. The problem is that still leaves us with a lot of capacity that we got to figure out what to do with. And All right, guys. I, so I just wanted to add. I'm sorry, I lost my voice earlier. Um, I think part of it is a usability uh, question as well, right? There are ways to instead of throwing up a 30 or a 15 second ad for a 15 second clip, maybe we like work on percentages, or we give a teaser of video before we move the ad in. Um, ways to increase the consumption, right? Um, and also with the responsive design. There are fewer pages and fewer things on there because you're more focused on what the user wants. Um, so those ads become more valuable, right? There's fewer slots to fill. Uh, so there may be things we can do that way as well. All right, so we're at 4 o'clock, which means we're half an hour. But I'm going to have one more question. I'd like you guys to give one or two simple sentence response. And then I'll open up the question for the floor in case anybody has one. So what is the one thing in responsive design that you would like to see improved or developed in 2013? I'll start with you. Chris, again. Just one? Um, just one. I would say I'd like to just see more sites uh, designed responsibly. Just take a shot at it and move the industry and um, see what happens and react to it and respond to it and iterate. Okay, great. Sam? Uh, I would really like to see more large screen design language. Uh, we've gotten pretty decent at small screen design language with mobiles and we've been pretty comfortable with medium size, which is like our desktop tabletish type size, but we have people browsing uh, from their televisions, people, billboards can in theory have the internet now, um, soon they probably will. And we don't, we simply don't have the design language for large screen um, sites or anything. So we need more of that. Yeah, that's Especially for, for video yeah. uh, content like you guys have. Uh, I'd say performance, I, mean, I mentioned this before, we've got to make responsive design more responsible. And right now, sort of in our first generation, we're sort of sending all the assets you know you need to build any website, and I think that the next stage of innovation has got to be about how do we make this really tightly focused for the specific device that you're at, so it's fast and peppy, loads quickly. Um, oddly, uh, the user experience guy would really like to see ads get solved, or at least the, some serious progress be made, because I think there's a lot of room for more sites being designed if we can figure out ways to monetize them. Yeah, I think sitting here for you know half hour I heard more questions about um, measurability of ads that that were concerning because the currency remains the same you have to figure out how to tag these ads guarantee them deliver them post them out and 
I haven't had one conversation on that in my six years here, so I think that figuring out how the <coughs> underpinning of that works so that we can commercialize this is something I'd like to see progress on. Okay. So does anybody sitting out there have a question? Solved all their problems. What was the name of that, that child tattoo site again? <laughs> <laughs> I like your style, sir. Tattly, T-A-T-T-L-Y.com. That's Swiss Misses. That's right, yeah. We'll bring it up so you guys can take a look at it. T-A-T-T-L-Y. -T -T she, she hires L -Y. Uh, artists right, to do really kind of cool and custom tattoos. She's one of my studio mates, and she's got literally, I don't know, tens of thousands of tattoos in the office. So there you go. Come on by. Anyone else? All right, I'm going to hand it over to Rob Gill, who's going to close this out. This will be super quick. So we're already over, so all I'm going to do is say thank you. So um, first, thanks to everybody that traveled in. I know there's been quite a few. Uh, Bruce and team had to leave, but they came over from Europe. We've got a lot of people from the West Coast. Um, also, thank you to our partners, Acquia, um, Phase 2, um, a lot of other folks that came in uh, today to speak, um, and our external friends, uh, NPR, et cetera, that came in. Um, but uh, big thanks to Tim Kirk. Yes, uh, Tim K. This, so if you want to stand up, Tim. Uh, and, of course, our volunteers, and also to Chris, who uh, did a lot of the coordination of this. So thanks, everybody. Um, uh, and also our production crew. As you can see, we have been video videotaping this. Uh, we're going to get it up uh, internally on my video, and hopefully we'll figure out a place to get it up externally also so that uh, our partners can view it and you can share it. So Excellent. thanks again. We'll do it next year. Thank you. Thank you.